to them. Children of the night, what music they make. Welcome back to Scored to Death, the podcast, the official podcast to the book Scored to Death, conversations with some of horror's greatest composers. My name is Jay Blake Fischera, and the goal of both the book and this podcast is to explore the craft of film scoring and celebrate the amazing composers that do it. This is part two of an in-depth interview with composer Wojciech Golczewski. In part one, we spoke at length about his musical origins in Europe's demo scene his work on the film's late phases and We Are Still Here, his method of finding film scoring work early in his career, and much, much more. Okay, let's get started. Before we move on to a couple of your more recent films, I'd really like to talk about an earlier film, Dark Souls. unique and crazy film sometimes when you see some of these films for the first time when you when you sit down to score them what's the kind of your reaction to a film like dark souls i'm assuming you watched it right i did yes because it's not not, i mean it's not really that popular i think it's it was like a a third feature film i worked on i think yeah Um, i'm not sure but it might be a third it was again the job i was actually you know chasing after I saw, I saw the teaser, I think, online, and just sent them my demos, and they were interested in, in working with me. So I put a lot of effort into that score, to be honest, and um, and to to this day, I think it's one of the, my better ones. I mean, I like all of them, but I like the general idea behind the score and how it actually blends uh, a, a lot of different techniques and sounds and, um, and styles. And they wanted something a bit different than we actually did. I mean, the part of the score uh, is something that they were interested in. They were imagining the score to be from the start, like a lot of this industrial sounds. Industrial cues are something that they were really, really happy about. Uh, all of this um, more symphonic or piano stuff and this classical approach. This is something I, ha- I actually had to talk them into work doing this. Because they weren't really interested in classical score in the beginning. And I wanted to just do a mix because I felt that uh, they wanted to focus more on the horror side of film. They didn't want to really bring up the emotional drama in, in that film. And when I saw the film, when I watched it for the first time, I was just like, well, there's a, a, a lot of emotions that I think should be just like, they wanted it to be straight horror film. And I felt like they actually created something different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like a, a, a bit of a drama with a horror and, and a story of a, of a father, which was, I think, well, I think uh, in general, I think this film is, I really like this film. Uh, many people don't, and they are just trashing it. Uh, I don't really, I can't really understand why, but... Um, I, I like it a lot, too. Yeah, it was a different kind of film. Yeah, and it's actually one of my favorite scores of yours as well. Uh and I'm thrilled that you talked them into it because I love kind of the juxtaposition of like this haunting piano, you know, juxtaposed against kind of the more industrial electronic stuff that comes later in the film. I think it works really well. Yeah, especially the, the main guy is also a music teacher. So I, I was just like, we should just like do more you know, classical stuff into, into it to actually make his character more viable you know bring some more depth into depth into, into his character not just like a, a you know a father chasing some 
to some different people that hurt his daughter and and that's it and also i wanted to focus on the, on the daughter itself which is you know a zombie but it's just like a completely different approach to a zombie and i i, I thought that this film is actually was actually pretty fresh at the time yeah it had some fresh ideas later i remember a few years later a couple of years ago and i can't remember really the title of the film and i didn't see the film but when i when i when i seen the poster and and, uh, and what the film is all about i instantly thought oh someone watched dark souls <laughs> uh, but it was uh, it, the, it was it was uh, arnold schwarzenegger playing a father of a zombie girl i think it was called maggie maybe yeah, Maggie. Yeah, I think it was called Maggie. And I didn't see that film, but it was just like when advertised as something pretty similar to Dark Souls, to be honest. And uh, I don't know if the actual film is is, is like that, but um, I was just like, wow. So the more uh, the heavier industrial electronic sound, that was what they were going for. And you brought a more of a classical piano sound to it. Yeah, they, 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 they didn't really... They, I mean, they, they let me do that, let me try that, but they weren't really searching for it in the beginning. But after they hear it, they actually start loving it, and they, we just went like 50-50 in the end. There's a lot of, uh, of teams and piano cues in the film, and, um, and it works great, I think. Uh, it's really, yeah, really cool little score. I agree. Like I said, it's one of my favorite uh, of your scores and for listeners that haven't seen dark souls it's a norwegian horror film and uh the score is beautiful and awesome and it's it's totally a film worth checking out if you haven't seen it <laughs> it's a bit weird to be honest i'm not sure if i understand everything 100 percent, but yeah I, I like films where you are actually you know you don't have to Oh, everything at the end. Yeah, it's definitely out there, yeah. but it's very unique and, and a very, like you were kind of uh, insinuating, it's a very interesting kind of take on the on the zombie thing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy and proud to be a part of the film, to be honest. Even, even if someone said it is a crap. To be honest, I mean, nowadays people are just, like, there are certain films out there which I absolutely love. I see they are getting trashed to the ground. Uh, and I'm guessing that just because majority of the people is just like expecting a certain type of films nowadays. And everything that's just not in this basket of the films is just instantly getting trashed. Even if I see some flaws here and there, I, I, I'm actually a, a big fan of indie horrors and, uh, and, and the, the effort that is put into making them. Sure. And like the most original stuff that's being done nowadays is indie horrors and there is absolutely no way to, to argue about it because um, if you want something fresh, you have to watch indie horrors. Yeah. I was recently reading an older interview with Sam Raimi, who did the Evil Dead films and produced The Grudge, which we were just talking about, the American version. But um, he was talking about how when he set out to make Evil Dead, because he wasn't necessarily uh, that big of a horror fan and horror films weren't really something that he was that interested in making at first. But when they decided to make a horror film for their first film, Evil Dead, and he started to really study horror and how suspense worked, he started to see that there really is like a specific skill to it and, and the tension that builds up and then whether you have a scare or you let it fade slowly. And he kind of compared it, the way of making a horror film and specifically working with suspense, he compared it to composing music compared to other films. It's, it's much more based on timing and, and, and that kind of stuff. Do you think that he might be right about that? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, yeah. I totally agree to be honest. Uh, I think horror is definitely something, you know, you can, you can easily just make it really, really bad with some bad directing, pacing and stuff like that. It's just like, this is really difficult genre of films to actually, uh, and uh, everyone who just thinks that you know you can just throw some scares here and there and you will get a you know people will still watch it and kind of enjoy it 
I guess you're really, really wrong because uh, to make a, a good horror film that works on a different levels as well is just like the most challenging thing yeah. in the film industry. I think it's uh, one of one of the most difficult genres of filmmaking for sure, and uh, and especially in terms of you know actually scaring people because nowadays I I actually enjoy the films where it's just like more of a psychological scare than actual, you know, scaring with the blood and puppets and, and, and all this stuff. I really love, I love films like Babadook, yeah. Yeah, which I really, really enjoyed. And, and and it's just like a really scary film. I mean, it's not really that scary because you're not like scared to death. But you're actually really, really scared in terms of once you realize what's going on, it's really, really scary, scary that, you know, this kind of things actually happen, like a real life scare kind of thing, which is extremely scary because this kind of things actually happen. Many people nowadays are just kind of one dimensional and shallow, to be honest. And I was like stuck that many people don't get what Baba Duck was all about that it was just like you know, uh, uh, sorry if I spoil for anyone here, so you might want to you know, not listen for a second. But it's just like uh, you know that the, that the woman is actually mentally ill and nothing is happening. That he's just like you know suffering a serious mental illness. When I read uh, uh, some some comments after the film, they were like. Why didn't they explain the Babadook? What was it? Where did it come? Go? You know what happened to this? You know they completely missed the idea behind the film, and they completely missed what actually was going on on the screen. Yeah, it was really one of the best horror films I, I watched last year. Yeah, or two years ago, and uh, and and that also opened my eyes on people and. <laughs> Kind of sad that so many people don't see obvious things, and this is also, I guess, a sign of our times. Humanity is just like going down the drain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But before we get into the final stretch, there's a couple more films I'd like to talk about. Uh, how did you come to work on Beyond the Gates? Beyond the Gates, I was talking to Barbara Crampton about Beyond the Gates, I think. And she mentioned to me that film, or I was seeing some info about it, and I saw that it was... And Barbara Crampton's in uh, We Are Still Here as well. Yep, yeah. So I knew Barbara from We Are Still Here, and, um, and she was producing that film, and also starred in, so I was like... I was watching to score something with that retro film because I was just like uh, starting to write uh, some electronic stuff on my own, my first albums, and I was just like, maybe I should just try to score a film in that way as well. Yeah. And when I saw um, uh, the, the, that they are filming uh, Beyond the Gates, I think on a Facebook someone just posted it that they finished shooting uh, and there was first, first concept behind the film and that it was like a VHS and retro kind of thing. I was just like, wow, that sounds like really, really fun. Maybe I should just ask Barbara if uh, they have anyone to actually score it. So I did and they didn't really hire anyone back in the time. They were still in production. Uh, so I said to Barbara that if they ever find my person suitable for this, they can just always contact me and uh, we can discuss it. And, and so they did. Yeah. That's how I actually got the job. I met the director, Jackson Stewart. We talk a lot on Skype and how he sees the film and what he wants it to be. And uh, he felt I was the right person. And uh, we spent like one month on scoring it. Really fun month without any problems pretty much very little fixes here and there not really that much of a difficulties instead in in terms of of, of some creative 
directions or misleads here and there. Everything was pretty smooth and uh, I really like that guy. He's really awesome. And, uh, now he's working on a second one, so uh, hopefully this will be a great one too. So when you're when you're talking to him and he's talking to you about the film and what he's looking for, uh, with a film that's kind of so based on nostalgia for a certain period, does he use references to films? Because, like you said, you didn't really start watching a lot of the horror films from that period until recently. Yeah, he was he was actually um, mentioning uh, quite some films. <laughs> I had to watch it. <laughs> that was the first time I actually watched The Fog. Uh, that was the first time I watched uh, a phantasm and, and, and films like that um, because actually uh, Jackson mentioned these films as one of his influences. So to actually you know, know better what he's up for, uh, I decided that of course I need to watch it. So I'm, I, I, I have uh, a few nights with uh, re-watching a, a lot of uh, classic horror films yeah. that he grew up on and that he actually enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, and that's that's how I actually know these films. Do you find that they're you know when you go back and you're revisiting or visiting for the first time these films that you hadn't seen before, because a filmmaker you know uses them as reference when he's talking to you about them? Do you worry that hearing the scores for the Fog and Phantasm, which are kind of iconic horror scores, are you worried that they might kind of taint your own creativity? Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm very worried about that every single time. And that's why, um, for example, I always try to see the cut they are sending me of a particular film, the cat, the temp, uh, the cat that has temp music in it, right? Yeah. I always try to do see to see it no more than once. Yeah, with the, with the temp track. Yeah, with the temp tracks, and instantly delete, delete it after I do because uh, I'm really, really scared that I will be influenced that I could just borrow some ideas without even noticing that sure because uh, i'm a firmly believer that uh, every single song is already written you you don't you you can't really write anything new at this point if there will be a machine or a person that that would have a knowledge of every single song cue track written ever you will be accused of plagiarism by a numerous other people if there would be a machine that would just get, you know, have this all that data inside and it would be able to just like really fast browse through everything that was already written. And you would just like put one your one of your tracks into that machine and there would be like, you know, thirty seconds of searching and then there would be like <laughs> 30, 30 other tracks pop up that sounds exactly the same. Unfortunately, we're probably not too far away from that. Yeah, that that's the truth. You, you, you can't really... The, the, the difference is that the people are not really, uh, you know, <laughs> that smart yet and they don't have a, such a machine yet. Yeah. And uh, But every single piece of music is already written numerous of times. Every single harmony, every single theme is already there in multiple songs, tracks, and stuff like that. So you will always have the danger of being accused of plagiarism. And to be honest, this is one of my, if not my main scare in terms of writing music, that someone will just come and say, this sounds exactly the same like this, or you rip off something, or you just, this is straight up blatant plagiarism here and there. Yeah. And so, so yeah, I'm really scared about that. Well, you figure, I mean, it's only, it's math, really. I mean, there are only so many notes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just like you said, and I always assume music is a math. It's just like, pretty much like a math. You just can't do numerous combination over and over again without being repetitive. Yeah. You can't do that. And yeah, so of course there are certain plagiarism that just so like obvious and just so forced that you know that someone was just like doing that in purpose. But I'm just really scared uh, that I will do something one day that, you know, it, it, you know, it's very easy to be labeled if you if you're gonna be labeled as someone who just do plagiarism, yeah, and just copy other people, it's really hard to recover from that. So yeah, uh, I'm really scared of that. So that's why I try to minimize, and I'm not I'm not listening to a lot of music. I'm actually working. 
the one I'm writing, for example, I'm not really listening to a, a, a lot of similar music because I don't want to be influenced. Every single music you, you, you're, you've heard in, in your life at some point is just sticking with you for the rest of your life and you may actually not really notice. There was a, a cue I once written that I absolutely loved and I thought, oh my God, I, it's just like so good. Uh, but it was something like disturbing and familiar about it and I couldn't really find what was it and I put that cue away for like a couple of months and I kept searching in my head what was the problem with it and finally I discovered it was really really similar to the main theme of Untouchables. And I instantly deleted it, but I'm, I was just like, it was just like a breathe out and just like a bigger relief that I actually found it. Yeah. What film had you originally written it for? Um, I can't remember, to be honest, but it was just, but it was like two or three years ago. So maybe late phases, I can't remember, but I, I was, I, I wasn't like, it was 1% I wasn't sure. And even I, I just like, I wanted to use it so bad because I really liked it, and, uh, and and even when I actually find out what it was, it was a lot smaller similarity than I would actually think yeah. it would be. But it was just enough, and and I knew in my head it was just enough for for me to know that you know this is these three notes one by one are the same, even if there is like different tempo and different different stuff and and 99.9 percent of the people won't really notice anything similar at all on this yeah but there's like this like one or two guys that may actually notice before because if i noticed it probably someone else will so so i just like deleted it and um, problem solved and that's a risky thing i guess you have to live with yeah uh, in doing the book, uh, I interviewed 14 composers, and now for the podcast, I've interviewed several more. And I, I found that for the most part, there's like two ways of working. There are certain composers that when they watch the film for the first time, or even in talking to the director or reading the script, they automatically start to hear music in their head. And then it becomes almost their job to like dictate it you know, either to paper or to a recording. And then there's other composers uh, like John Carpenter or Claudio Simonetti from Goblin that are, are more improvisational based. Uh, they sit down with the film and the keyboard or whatever instrument they they decide to write on and they start to play things while they watch and they end up, you know, finding what they want and then pursuing that. So it's definitely more improvised. Do you fall into one of those categories? I think both at some point, I guess. Yeah. Because when I watch the film, I generally instantly start hearing sounds. I, mean, I, I don't hear themes or, or melodies or anything like that, but I instantly start to hear certain uh, sound of the score I would like it to be. Like what, what sound would work with that and uh, what kind of emotions I would like to underline with with this particular picture. Uh, so this I get instantly, but when it comes to actually developing a themes or developing the music itself, then it's usually like I, I get a scene I have to work with and uh, I know what, what I know how it will sound, but I'm starting to actually writing the actual music theme or whatever as a, some form of improvisation, that's for sure. So uh, uh, I always get the initial idea. And for example, uh, I always get the idea if the temp music is fitting at all, if I see the first cut or just I see, com I hear completely something different. That's a uh, case in many films, to be honest. Yeah. So I get uh, and always stick with the first thing I hear in my head. If I hear that it, this should be a classical, approach, I always stick with them. If I hear electronic music, I always stick with electronic. But uh, And then I just sit and pretty much I always 
I always say that for me, the music just writes itself. When I have a scene in front of me, I just kind of like note here, note there, note, and all of a sudden you have a piece of music. And then that's, that's how I work. I, I don't really. So you get an, an initial instinct of, uh, you know, what sounds, what type of score it should be, and then you let that guide the rest of your work on a film. Pretty much, yeah. You know, a film that came out uh, in 2016, Tonight She Comes. talked about it uh, a little bit earlier and you said that you got a lot of freedom from Matt Stewart's how did you come to uh, Tonight She Comes? Tonight She Comes that was actually Matt Stewart's who uh, dropped me an email if I would be interested in scoring the film Uh, he loved we are still here and uh, he dropped me an email saying that he's just like um, finishing this uh, little indie horror and if I would be interested in working with it and seeing it at first and if I like what I see if I would be interested in writing some music for it he wanted it to be a, a kind of retro thing so he thought that I would be the right guy for it and uh, I watched the film I really liked it but uh, it has some flaws as well of course but it was very very rough footage so he actually ended ended up taking a lot of my suggestions into account and just changing the film a lot. And it is a really small film. I have family and, and kid to feed. Yeah. So I, I didn't I didn't know if I can put so much time and effort into into this film. And I don't know if they will have a budget for me. So I actually decided that I would do it uh, for a special on special terms because I really like the enthusiasm and um, and I think the film had the potential and the outcome turned out that I was right because the film did pretty nice on festivals and get some pretty big distribution uh, for, a, for a film of its scale. So I really like that. And, uh, and of course the main thing was just like uh, Matt was just like man, you can just do whatever you want. <laughs> whatever you whatever you feel is working, do it. And he was happy with that decision. Yeah, and he was really really happy with the with the music. I mean, there was absolutely not one single cue that he wanted me to fix or just change something. It was one hundred percent creative freedom, and this was probably why I did this film. Yeah, because uh, the budget was really really small, but when someone is actually still paying you their really, really hard earned money from pretty much their own pocket sure. and give you 100, 100% freedom. Just It's just like a dream come true, to be honest. And on top of that, the film is not shit because let's just be clear that um, I wouldn't work on a film that I don't find a cool one. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the best film in the world, but it has to have something and it has to have certain quality. I already rejected a lot of films that were paying a lot, lot more money than many others that I've made. But I was just not go. I was just not happy with the quality of the film. And to be honest, I don't want to be associated with a film in quality that I don't find at least good. Yeah. So what? They are paying me twenty five grand. I'm just not gonna do it, right? It's just. Money is not everything. When a director gives you kind of total freedom, like tonight she comes, how do you come up with kind of the sound palette that you want to work with? Well, just the usual things. I just watch the cut and I hear the sounds. Yeah. If you want electronic stuff, I mean, kind of retro electronic, a bit of carpenterish stuff, but not too much. Just like pretty much everyone, I guess. Something like that, but but not 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 this. <laughs> so this is pretty much the description of everyone. Yeah, uh, uh, but well, it was just like a, this classical cabin in the woods film, so it was obvious that we would go just like a certain, a carpenterish way. I mean, this is pretty much the most carpenterish 
favorite soundtrack I ever made, probably. But uh, it, uh, it's also one of my favorite favorites, to be honest. I mean, a couple of tracks is really simple. I mean, pretty close to all this Carpenter's retro synth stuff. But there's a different stuff that's not really yet released that are completely different as well. So I think when people actually get to hear the full soundtrack, the, the, it will be pretty, pretty different reception. And the whole soundtrack's being released? Uh, well, it's going to be released in the vinyl by, by Death Wall sooner or later um, this year, maybe even. So we will see. Then, of course, we will have a cassette release of, the, of, of it as well from Data Airlines. So um, this soundtrack is just, it feels for me just like not only a soundtrack, but just like one of my personal LPs as well. Yeah. Uh, more and more personal work because it, it was like a dream come true because working with a picture is always really nice. It's, it's easier for me to write the music when you have a picture. So even if I write my own stuff, which is not film related, I always create a story and develop some images in my head to actually write uh, because I can't really write something that's not related to like like Okay, I'm gonna sit now and just write one track, and it's it's gonna be it. Uh, whatever track it will, it will be, it will be just a track. I I need to have some images associated with that, whether it's gonna be real images or or a story in my head. But it just had to have something because otherwise I would probably just sit and just do nothing because sure I can't really work uh, any other way. And film scoring for films just kind of taught me that. I really have to do that. Yeah. Well, I would love to talk to you a little bit before we go about some of your albums like Reality Check and The Signal. clearly kind of conceptual in the way that you're describing. Yeah, they are, they are part of the trilogy. And the last part is coming this year. And it's a story about a, an astronaut in space who lived in a space station and received some strange signals that he decided to leave the station and try to pursue the and search and for the origins of that signals. So it's a kind of like a, a little story, um, kind of thing, a, a, a mixture of, of my favorite sci-fi films like Sunshine and uh, Aliens and, and even Horizon and stuff like that. It, 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 this is a kind of a mixed uh, a story in my head based on all these films I really loved I, because I'm absolutely like a sci-fi freak. Yeah. Even more than the horror one, I really. It, it, if you make a movie that's gonna be like three hours long, but you have a space spaceship coming through space for 180 minutes, I would still watch it and be very very happy. <laughs> because well, I don't know. It's kind of like a, I, I I get so get so comfortable and relaxed when I see such images. That I, I I really loved watching that, and one of my favorite movies of all time is Solaris by uh, Steven Soderbergh. Not not the original one. Uh, many will be surprised, but I think that the, the Soderbergh version is really really cool. Uh, it, it, it's really about love and emotions, and, and it's really like a poetic and really beautiful in terms of the, the soundtrack. Is probably my number one soundtrack ever by Cliff Martinez. absolutely beautiful and the uh, images are beautiful uh, it, it has a suspense it, it, it's just I could watch this film over and over and over again it's just so really well done and I don't really care if it's close to the book or not it's not really important it's just like a beautiful film yeah really really beautiful film and um, 
so yeah, so th this was the idea behind the behind reality check, and um, and I was actually um, that was the storyline behind this trilogy. Uh, I've done it like in 2015, I think, in the beginning, and it just like spent over one year in my drawer before I actually played it to anyone. Uh, because I wasn't really, I wasn't really thinking that anyone would be interested in this. And then I uh, sent it to guys at Lakeshore and, uh, and to Spencer at Death Walls, and they were just like instantly, wow, this is great, you should release it. And so I did, and that's how I actually started to write my own music again. Uh, yeah. Which is uh, great, like, uh, I just, I just needed a, uh, I just needed some kind of relief for the film working when, when, where you are forced to do stuff that you are not always want to do, right? And, but you have to do that and you have to make people happy. And this is, this was my relief. I could just like do something on my own. And I wasn't really thinking that I would ever start making my own music again. It turns out that Reality Check and The Signal both were like a really huge success, and uh, and I was just like, wow, that's just like completely overwhelming to be honest, and I wasn't really expecting that. And there is like um, so many people now listening to my music that just like it gives me a kick to to do more and more and more. And actually, it's also you know I don't really make like a, a fortune with these albums, but they are also a a, a good relief that are good for my uh, comfort in terms of work because if you're working in a film industry you never know if you're gonna get another job right yeah you're you're completely dependent on, on, on people coming to you and offering you work and now i can just like do 50 50 which is like a great thing that you know i know that even if i won't get a movie for like a few months I, I still have a work to do, my personal stuff, that is also, you know, uh, a, a, a part of who I am at the moment. I'm not solely a film composer that yeah. is just working on the films, but I just work on my own personal music that I'm really happy that people are interested in listening in it, buying it, because, you know, there's not, nothing more rewarding than people wanting to spend some money, some real money. On your music, uh, because we all know that most people don't have a lot, and the fact that they are still buying your records is just like the biggest reward you can get. I'm just living a dream, to be honest. I, yeah. um, I wish like there was more people that could get a chance, uh, like I did. I'm just a tiny, 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 tiny film composer doing you know small films, and, and many people will never recognize my name or know how to pronounce it if you're American. I know how to pronounce it, yeah. <laughs> but still i'm living this my own little dream and you know i couldn't ask for more to be honest so really really blessed with, uh, with awesome people uh, supporting me and, uh, I think that's a good place to stop. I mean, it seems like a good message. I think we covered a lot. I would I would just ask for people that haven't listened or heard your own personal music like Reality Check and The Signal, like how would you describe the music, the sound for the people that might be interested in checking it out? It's a mix of everything, I guess. Uh, in in general, it's an electronic style, but it's a mixture of my of sounds of my youth, like uh, there is a lot of um, uh, computer music, um, like yeah, like if coming from Commodore 64, uh, Sid stuff, like chip music, with with a lot of um, synth stuff. Uh, the signal is more like a nineties electronica, Jean Michel Jarre, Van Elizabeth. Uh, reality check is more like an old school, maybe more carpenter stuff, if you want to call it that stuff. That 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 thing is like. It's not, every, everything is a, a bit different. End of transmission is just like a pure mini mock, uh, old school uh, electronic stuff, uh, which is probably my favorite at the moment. And um, if you like electronic music, I think you would just, if you like electronic storytelling, 
know, Tangerine Dream and stuff like that. I think you may like it. Yeah. I think it's great. I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised that so many people like it and love it. And still, it's not really that popular because we're, you know, we are not mainstream. But uh, I couldn't ask for more, to be honest. Uh, there are thousands of people I really appreciate. Yeah, well, this was fantastic. You know, I had seen many of the films that you scored before I even thought about doing the podcast. So it was a lot of fun to revisit them with your music kind of in mind and, and hear kind of how eclectic your catalog is throughout all these movies. And then to discover these albums that we're talking about end of transmission and reality check and the signal and discover that kind of music. I, I I'm way into this new phase of electronic music that's coming out with the intent of being kind of like film scores to films that don't exist. It's a lot of fun for someone that loves music and film scores the way I do and, 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 and has an eclectic taste and listens to all kinds of things. I, I love listening to your stuff and, and I loved listening to uh, reality check and the signal. And, and when can you said there's a third one on the way? Yeah. The third one should be like uh, June or something like that. Pretty much the same time. Every of the two previous ones were released around May, June. Yeah. So I'm trying to retain that uh, one year separate dates on all the trilogy so so yeah it should be it should be out pretty soon and also uh your soundtrack for ted gagan's mohawk which uh that that's just recently got released as well uh, that's a little yeah that's a little like a, a mini album that is consists more of a uh, tracks that didn't make to the film oh i see a couple of the main ones and uh, and a few ones that didn't make to the film variations and alternate versions and, uh, and the main soundtrack will be probably coming next year, I guess, after the... Interesting. And the Beyond the Games on the vinyl from Death Wars is coming as well in a couple of months, I guess. So. What do you make of this? Uh, it's become more than a trend now, because it's been around for so many years, but this occurrence of having all these record labels that are releasing these film scores and also kind of like these non-film score film scores i think people are just in search of something different i guess and uh, something that's just not something with a heart to be honest and that's it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty funny that actually there is more heart in the electronic music now than ever uh, because of what we have on uh, on the tv stations and on radio is just like a pure copy crap that's just like you know Everything is the same, and people are just searching for something true again. And these these people that are creating these imaginary soundtracks and all these retro synth albums. And of course, I'm not talking about the, the the synth wave in general because there's also just like a, pretty much all is the same to be honest. And there's just like one group pop, popping after another just with the same sound. Uh, but there's a lot of unique voices that in labels like Death Walls and Lakeshore is releasing a lot of uh, these artists uh, as well. They, they have a, a, like a new thing to do uh, that started a bit with Android Transmission that they are releasing this, um, this really cool underground artists that are doing great stuff that no one would actually hear about if, if it wasn't for these labels. So. Um, I'm really happy that it's actually going on. Of course, we will see how long that will actually last. But uh, I think people are just in need of something true. And these people are just bringing something new to the table. And there is a general uh, nostalgia for, for this kind of music. So I'm really happy to actually see that. Many of my friends are on these labels and, uh, and I couldn't be more happier. For them to actually release their stuff and, and getting some recognition for, for what they are doing because many of them are absolutely awesome and you know if comparing to me to, to this just like a, a, a giant to a, to a little guy and they are way better than i will ever be and they are just not that lucky as i am and it's really great to, to see that someone is finally discovering them and giving, a, giving them a chance to, to do something uh, with their music more than just, you know, getting heard by 100 people. Any other film projects on the horizon for you? 
I just finished uh, another uh, film with uh, Travis Stevens, the producer of We Are Still Here in Mohawk, and my friend uh, Matt Osterman, who I did uh, Phasma X uh, Ghost from the Machine and uh, 400 Days with. Yeah. Uh, it's a new sci-fi thriller, I guess. Sci-fi thriller, you can, you can, you can, you can call it like that, uh, called Hoover. Uh, no release date yet, but the film is pretty much done. Mm -hmm. And we just finished like one week ago. And yeah, and I'll be finishing the last part of the Reality Check trilogy now. And um, so far, I think I don't have any big film, big film project coming uh, on the horizon. So I will probably just write more of my own music. Well, I appreciate you making the time. I know it was hard to get your schedule in order. I appreciate you making so much time. This was a lot of fun. I'm really thankful for the chance to be here and really happy to be able to talk to you finally. It's, uh, it's been a real treat. Yeah, it's a pleasure. That's it for this two-part interview for Scored to Death, the podcast. I, of course, need to thank Wojciech Golchewski for giving so much of his time and knowledge to the show. If you've been enjoying the podcast, the book, Scored to Death, Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other places you buy books. Or you could order a signed copy from me directly. Just contact me through scoredtodeath.com. You can also find and follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Scored to Death. Scored to Death, the podcast, is available on most podcast apps and distribution sites, as well as on SoundCloud and YouTube. Please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show on iTunes, or on whichever provider you use to listen to podcasts. Ratings and reviews will help the podcast get recommended to potential listeners and raise awareness for the show. My other podcast, Saturday Night Movie Sleepovers, can also be found on iTunes, Google Play Music, and most places you find podcasts, and on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at Sat Sleepovers. And I should note that the short clips of music used in this podcast were used strictly to put aspects of the interview into context, to audibly illustrate specific things discussed, and for educational purposes. You can find Wojciech on Twitter at W underscore Golchevsky. And you can purchase all of his music that we discussed in this episode at VojtechGolchevsky.bandcamp.com, as well as the newly released End of Transmission 2. Also, as of the posting of this episode, the release of his follow-up to the albums Reality Check and The Signal should be right around the corner, so make sure you keep an eye out for those. In this episode, Wojciech mentioned the scores for... The Untouchables by Ennio Morricone, which is available in all formats from A&M Records, and Solaris by Cliff Martinez, which can be found on CD from La La Land Records and on vinyl LP from Envata. Thank you so much for listening to Score to Death, the podcast. Come back in two weeks for another in-depth interview with one of horror's greatest composers. Mm -hmm.